You want me to stop sharing for the start? Uh, no, you'll be okay there. All right. And we are starting. Hello, everyone. Sorry for the delay. Looks like there's already everybody in here. Good. We've got, all right, 36. Um, cool. Well, we will, we will get started here. Um, so we have Jeff Vanderwilt. Um, hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, we've got Jeff Vanderwilt here is going to talk um, about the conservation implementa implementation strategy. Um, so like before, if you, if you have questions, feel free to use the Q&A down at the bottom. Um, and then Jeff, so we keep you up to speed if we have a question um, and it's kind of pertinent to something that you're um, talking about at the moment. I might jump in. Um, you'll either hear me or see me. I'll jump in and ask the question because I don't think you'll be able to see the Q and A. Um, right. And I'll ask those questions. Um, and then if there's any discussion, there's a little chat down on the bottom that everyone can use. Um, so yeah, so we are recording too. So if you have to, I know a couple of people said they might have to to run out a little, little early. Um, so we are recording, so you'll get that as soon as we're finished. Um, but with that, we will get started. Um, so thanks, Jeff, for joining us. Um, and I will let you take it from here. All right, very good. Well, I'll start out by saying uh, good morning from sunny Nebraska this morning. I am um, down in Lincoln, Nebraska. For those that don't know, um, I'm currently serving as the acting state conservationist down in Nebraska. So, um, but I'm glad to be with you this morning. Um, glad I'm, I, I can have the opportunity to talk about CIS with you guys a little bit and hopefully maybe answer some of your questions. Um, I did tell Blaine, I've never been a presenter on Zoom. Um, so hopefully I don't screw that part of this up too bad. I, I just don't have the uh, experience with it that I do with Teams. I've done several presentations through Teams. But uh, thankfully, well, I don't know about thankfully, I haven't, haven't been on a ton of Zoom calls. They've all been team calls. So, but anyways, um, wanted to talk a little bit about um, basically these two documents that we've put together for CIS, um, kind of go over the history a little bit, um, kind of give you that background, and then we'll dive into the uh, uh, template itself a little bit and cover some of those topics, topics as well. But I really wanted to make sure that um, you guys kind of understood the, the history or, or the purpose of, of why we're going down this approach. And so I've got the vision document up, or I call it the vision document um, of CIS. And I kind of just wanted to give you the history and talk about this, this document just a little bit. Um, Oregon was the first state that kind of went this way with delivering their programs. And um, one of the things um, when Jeff Zimprich was still here, uh, him and I would have several conversations about, you know, what can we do to affect change to actually move that conservation needle um, in South Dakota? And I had uh, gotten to know the assistant for programs in Oregon um, through some of my um, details that I had done. And of course, Jeff uh, knew the state con in Oregon as well. And so we, we decided that it would be a good idea to go out and see what it is that they were doing with their programs. Um, a lot of attention had kind of been, or the spotlight had kind of been put on Oregon with how they were implementing their program. So um, I went out to Oregon and actually met with their leadership team uh, and had an opportunity to kind of discuss with them their program delivery method and, and the benefits and, and as well as some of the, the negatives about, about going down this route. Um, uh, with program delivery. So one of the biggest things that um, that kind of drove us to go this route was was this idea of moving that conservation needle of being able to actually measure outcomes. Um, for those of you that have been uh, with the conservation districts for quite a while, um, know that our programs are very popular. Um, we, we, you know, we get a lot of applications every year and we do a lot of good with, with um, individual landowners, but we don't 
do um, targeted projects. We don't uh, actually have a way of saying, you know, this is this is a resource concern we've gone in and addressed, and and we we were able to affect this change. I think a lot of you may have heard over the years, you know, we talk about this shotgun approach where we do something up here in this corner of the county and we do something down here and, and it's just spread all over the place and we don't actually go into an area and try to affect change. So when you see, um, you know, for me, the easiest one to kind of relate to is, is our 319 water quality projects or the TM or the, um, 303 D list, they call it. These are our impaired streams and water bodies in South Dakota. When you look at those, you never see much for change from year to year. Um, and that I, I, I attribute it to that to our shotgun approach where we are working with one individual in a watershed affecting change on their operation. But in the grand scheme of things, that's not enough to affect change within that watershed. And so our thought process was that if we could go into a watershed or into a specific location and affect change with several, basically neighbors together, uh, we can actually affect some change on natural resources in South Dakota where we can actually go in and say, hey, this is what we accomplished. We can measure um, soil health beforehand. We can measure water quality beforehand. We, could emit, we can measure erosion beforehand. And we can come out the other side of this project and say, okay, now let's go back and do those same measurements. And we should be able to say, okay, we, we removed this much sediment from the water or we kept this much soil uh, where it belongs versus watching it run away uh, or soil and health, soil health improved by X percent um, in these, it, it, during this project timeframe. So our, our, our true mission, our true goal out of this whole thing is how can we affect change? How, how can we move that conservation needle and, and be able to celebrate our accomplishments? Uh, I've been kind of teased about this a little bit, but it is still near and dear to my heart is the fact that at the end of these projects, I wanna be able to have a barbecue. Um, I wanna be able to get all these folks together and say, Here's what we accomplished and let's celebrate our accomplishments. Let's take a minute, let's pat each other on the back. Let's have a beverage and a good meal. And let's just, you know, let's just celebrate the fact that we were able to move that conservation needle, even if it was only by a little bit. And so, um, you know, in talking with Blaine about, about this presentation, you know, one of the things he said, you know, we just wanted to make sure that everybody had a better understanding. And, and that I think is um, a good point in that I think a little bit of what's happened on this first year was expectations were not um, conveyed appropriately. I think a lot of what I've seen out of this first go round is that people are kind of shooting for the moon um, or think that they need to shoot for the moon. Uh, and that's not what this is about. This is about moving the conservation needle, even if it's only a little bit, right? Um, because it's the little bits that are going to add up to a big hole when we when we look at these 10, 15, 20 years from now. We're going to do a project in this particular watershed, and then we might move down to the next watershed below it, you know, three to five years from now and start working there. And, and as, as these build, you know, that conservation effect will build along with it. So I, I want to really stress that I don't want everybody shooting for the moon. That's not the expectations. The expectations is just to show change, a measurable change um, in, in the natural resources in South Dakota. So when you're thinking about a project, when you're thinking uh, of, of putting a project together, do not get bogged down in the fact that, oh, I'm not affecting enough change. Do not let that thought process creep into your mind um, because we are dealing with mother nature. We are dealing with natural resources and changes take time um, on some of these things. Uh, you know, if you, if you were to look at a grazing system, those plant communities don't change overnight. Those, the amount of production uh, in our grass communities doesn't change overnight. There's a lot of different things that factor into that. And so I, I found with this first year, that people were really thinking they needed to shoot for the moon, that they had to have this big 
change um, that they were going to measure and that's not the case at all. Uh, we don't expect great and grandiose things to come out of these projects, but we do want to measure that change. And so, um, you know, what I kind of wanted to highlight here um, about the benefits um, and kind of get to this point, and hopefully you can kind of see what I highlighted there, um, this fourth bullet under the benefits, uh, you know, it, it's about having clear goals and objectives yeah. um, that you're able to monitor and evaluate and report on those achievements. So that's one of those things that I really kind of want to point out um, as, as being the main strategy or the main goal of, of CIS. Can you scroll down? Uh, what's that? Can you scroll down? We can't see. Oh, gotcha. The benefits part. So it's right, right here. Hopefully you can see that. This is just a one page deal. So it's no, we right can only here. see half of your page. <laughs> oh, okay. See there again, that's where I'm not a Zoom expert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there it's kind of close to the top. And that's as far as I can get it to go. So hopefully that works. Really? Huh. Yes. Yeah, we can only still see half of it. That's weird. Unless I'm doing something wrong, but that's as far as it'll scroll for me on my on my particular view. Huh. Interesting. Like I said, I've never presented on Zoom before, so I'm not really familiar. Can you shrink the percentage, um, the Zoom percent? Up in the yeah, top. but that just moved it towards the bottom. So we're looking at, make sure we're looking at the same screen that you're looking at. You have your PDF open, right? Yep. Um, and you've got two tabs, like a projects template and a vision sheet. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the vision sheet. The projects template was the next thing that I was going to to cover. Um, so I don't know. I wonder if we can try re <laughs> Just wondering if we tried to reshare it real quick. Maybe we could. Good. Okay, there it went. There it moved down. I'm not sure what you did. <laughs> um, apparently, it had stopped sharing when I moved screens, which I did not realize. So I hit start sharing again, and then, yeah. Okay. Okay. We're good now. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Nope, it's all good. All right. So, yeah, again, you know, we're, we're really about measuring that change. And so, one of the things that's been brought up a lot um, is is um, how do we how do we do how do we measure essentially, and you know it really depends on what you're trying to uh, accomplish. Obviously, the measurements are going to be different, um, but the interesting thing so far, I will say, is that there are a lot of partners that are willing to help with monitoring um, out there. Um, and I'm not going to necessarily, you know, obligate anybody to any of this, but, you know, I've talked with Game Fishing Parks, uh, East Dakota Water Development District, Fish and um, Pheasants Forever, um, even Ducks Unlimited. Some of those folks are, are all willing to, you know, to help in some way, and maybe that help is with the monitoring. That is going to be, or probably is the uh, sort of the biggest hurdle in my mind um, with this approach. And, I, and I've and i certainly heard that from, from some of our staff per se, uh, when, you know, NRCS themselves, we don't do a whole lot of monitoring, which again leads to why we are not able to really say what it is that we've accomplished with, with some of our program dollars. So, you know, I've done a little work um, and talking with some folks about being able to assist with monitoring. Again, it depends on what needs to be done and who we need to talk to to help with that monitoring. So, you know, if you are in that boat where you're not sure um, how to get the monitoring accomplished, certainly let me know. I can maybe put you in touch with the right people um, or at least point you in the right direction. Um, 
our staff um, will certainly help discuss what monitoring should look like, um, but we may or may not be able to help with monitoring ourselves. Again, it depends on what it is. Um, we have worked out a deal on at least one of our projects with water quality monitoring. Uh, East Dakota was kind enough to offer a discounted uh, water uh, testing effort uh, for this particular project that was going to monitor water quality. So that, like I said, there's options out there. It's a matter of, of matching up the right people and putting them together. So if you are in that boat, certainly let us know and uh, we'll certainly try to um, get you in the right direction. So. That in a nutshell um, is kind of the history or the philosophy behind it. I guess just to let you know, um, we have equip dollars, easement dollars, CSP dollars are all available um, for this effort. This is the first year we've offered CSP. Um, I haven't had anybody contact me yet about trying to include CSP. Uh, obviously, the situation is that we still need to follow all of our program rules. So with CSP, right, we need to um, still enroll the entire operation. We still need to use the same enhancements, um, those kinds of things. But I believe that we can combine CSP easements and equip into a into one project proposal to to try to move that conservation needle inside these project area. So um, <clears throat> the other thing that we ran across, as I say, project areas is there was a lot of questions about what a project area should look like. How big should it be? How small should it be? Um, you know, those are all really tough questions to answer without uh, discussing particular projects. I would tell you that they could probably be as small as a township. They can certainly be as small as a watershed. They certainly should not really follow political boundaries because our, our resource concerns don't follow political boundaries. And so what I mean by that is it really shouldn't be, well, we're gonna include the entire county of Day County, let's just say. Well, that's, that's no different than what we're doing with our programs now because the entire Day County is eligible the way that it is now. This is about going in and, and, and targeting at least a little bit. So whether it's watershed, whether it's a few townships because there's a salinity issue in this corner of Day County or something like that, that's what we're after. And the size really comes down to what is it you're able to monitor so that you can measure that change. <clears throat> so I don't think, you know, we've we definitely have some projects that cover multiple counties but not obviously not the entire counties it just crosses those borders it's um just kind of where that project fell out it covers spink day and i think even a little bit of marshall county kind of follows that border along there uh, i think maybe part of brown county as well you know with one of our current projects um so that's just kind of the the area that they wanted to target because of of the salinity issue that existed within that area. So um, if you wanna discuss target areas or project areas, I'm always willing to do that, but really understand it comes down to you and your decisions as to what, um, what those resource concerns look like in that area and what can you measure and monitor in that area. So that really um, is kind of the driving factor behind how you're gonna determine your project area. Uh, last year, we took a third of our easement dollars and a third of our equip dollars and set them aside. <clears throat> uh, we didn't quite make it to a, th a third of the dollars. So we didn't quite use all the funds last year with the projects that we did fund. This year, uh, we'll be setting two thirds aside. Uh, our, our folks did not want us to dive in kind of head first, I'll say. So we kind of stuck our toe in the water last year. Uh, this year, you know, we're going to try to get waist deep. And then uh, after the third year, we're going to try to be all in pretty much. So, yeah, this is year two. So we're going to be about two thirds. And then next year, hopefully we'll be at um, using all of our program dollars this way, essentially. 
Hey, Jeff. Uh, did, yep, go ahead. I did have a quick question. I'm not sure if you saw the Q&A, and I think you kind of answered it um, a little bit. But there's a question that if I get approved for a conservation commission grant um, in April for a livestock watering with managed grazing system, would this work as a CIS project? Um, it has four counties involved, and would that be too big for a CIS? And you kind of answered that part. Right. Yeah, I'm going to say that for the most part, that's probably too big. But with that being said, some of the work that that's been done on that uh, commission grant application can then be put into this so one of the things we strive for is to have projects i'll say sort of on the shelf um, because there's always different options so you got the commission grants as an option we've got cis as an option and then there's also rcpp the regional conservation program so all those have fairly similar uh, thought processes or similar, what do I wanna say, project proposals that it, once you develop it for one, it doesn't take a whole lot of retooling to make it available for the next one. And that's what we wanted to do um, is to give people multiple options of ways to get their projects funded. And this to me was another opportunity that we could add to that toolbox, I guess you would say, uh, of ways to get projects funded. So hopefully that kind of answers that question. Um, maybe even a little bit more than it needs to be answered, but. Um, one last thing on this document, uh, and then we'll move on, is that <clears throat> we, we developed a process where um, we're going to announce for projects pretty much every November, the due dates will be pretty much every April. So that gives you roughly five, six months uh, to put those proposals together, which is we try to make it a good long time because we feel like there needs to be a lot of thought put into these. And uh, so we wanted to make sure we gave plenty of time. Also wanted to make sure that we gave plenty of an opportunity that if there was certain data you needed to, to uh, um, you know, back up your proposal and that was something that we could help provide, we'd be willing to help provide that. Uh, then in May, uh, we'll make our selections. And kind of what's different about our process is that while we'll make those selections in May, you won't actually receive any funding until um, the following fiscal year, so October. Now, I, I say October, and I hope you all understand how the federal government works. Uh, we don't always actually get our money in October like we're supposed to. Um, so but when that money does show up after October 1, we'll start working with you on the projects if they got funded. But to explain the thought process is from May, when we tell you your project's been selected for funding, and say October or November when those funds actually show up, that's your opportunity to start um, doing outreach, to start letting producers know this is available, to start that planning process, um, so that we can have good conservation plans or good projects within your project lined up and ready to go for when the funding does come. That way when the funding comes, uh, we still have to jump through our hoops, right? We still have to do a ranking, you know, CART. You've all heard of CART. We got to go through the CART process, get that all done, get those contracts obligated. And then once those contracts are obligated, then the producer can actually start doing the work. So, um, you know, as much as we try, or I would love to try to get away from some of our processes, there are some that are just required. And so we still have to jump through those hoops. So. All right, we just had another quick question, Jeff, back on the, goes back to the um, monitoring discussion from earlier. Mm -hmm. um, okay. You mentioned the East Dakota Water Development District was going to help with monitoring at a discounted rate. Does NRCS have dollars to assist them with this? So no, not directly. Um, however, there are, again, options of ways to find funding. Um, if you're not familiar with the CCA, CCGA process, 
That is a process where you could apply again to NRCS for technical assistance funds, which then could be used for the monitoring. So um, we do have that available. Uh, we could do a straight up contribution agreement as well. Um, so there are a few options out there, um, but again, some of the partners are willing to do that. So there, you know, partners might have funds. You might be able to get some funds from NRCS. It's a little bit of a, a chicken and egg thing, obviously, with which one you get first and how that comes about. But there are there are options of ways that we can try to work with you. If we know, right? If we know that you are needing funds for monitoring, we can obviously, hopefully work with you to get those if you do a ccga type situation try to do our best to make sure that uh, we get a good proposal put together for that and try to get that funded as well so there are options but we don't have anything specifically set aside for um, cis so uh, if you have conservation commissions funds that can be used for it or you know any other grants nifwif grants NACA grants um, certainly, um, any of those funds, you know, provided their rules allow for it, right? Any of those funds could be used to help with the monitoring as well, um, if if allowed. So, okay. so any other questions on kind of the vision? That's uh, that that's the history. That's the background. That's the strategy um, that we're trying to employ here. So before I switch and over to the template. Uh, just wanted to make sure we kind of had all the questions answered about this. Yep, we had we had one other. Um, do you have any examples of projects they were doing in Oregon? Well, um, I do. Um, not with me. The one that sticks in my head um, because I was actually there for the selection process of this one was that they had. Uh, an area. Uh, now they they work. They don't work on a county basis. They they work on a watershed basis. So their their structure is a little different out in Oregon. So they had a watershed where there was a lot of CRP that was getting set to expire, and they put a CIS together to provide fencing and you know water infrastructure and those kinds of things to try to keep that CRP from being. Um, broken up and, and farmed again and being able to offer producers an option to where they could turn that into grazing land um, after the CRP expired. So they put a CIS together for that, that particular watershed did with that target was to keep CRP grass as grass and not have it converted back to farmland. So um, that was one that I know that they approved while I was out there. Um, I've got a few, bo few more um, actually laying on my desk back in South Dakota, but I don't have them with me. Um, I did bring them back when we came back from Oregon, so. Okay, I was thinking too, I could send along the, um, they have a website, their, their NRCS website that has those examples too. Of course, we have, we have ours with all of our projects going on too, that I can, I'll send those out in emails afterwards, all the South Dakota projects and then the, the Oregon projects for ideas. And the links are right here as well on this vision sheet if you have the vision sheet. So, and if you don't, we can always get that to you as well. Yep. Yeah, we're trying to create a, a map um, so that everybody can see what those projects look like. They can see what they're trying to accomplish. There should be a, a brief write up of each project that we funded last year on the site as well. Um, I think it's pretty well done I haven't they were still trying to finalize it when I when I left South Dakota and came down here to Nebraska so I I kind of have been left out on the uh, finishing touches but I think it's actually done so yeah it sounds like we had we had touched base last week about that map um, we we're gonna incorporate it into a website and I think if not yeah if it's not done already um, already completed um, I think she said that by the end of this week. So yeah. we'll get that out to everybody. Yep. Very good. So that okay. Looks, that's all the questions for now. Okay. I'm going to switch here. Let me get back to the top. Okay. So now, did it switch screens for you? We're on the, the yep. projects. Okay. Good. Just wanted to be sure. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> 
fire yeah. trucks going by. <laughs> uh oh. That's yeah. Right. Oh, that's one thing about being in a big town now. Boy, I hear fire trucks. There's a fire station not far away, and I hear fire trucks several <laughs> times a day. <laughs> it's a little weird. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Downtown Lincoln. So, uh, anyways, so here's the um, the outline uh, uh, the template that we kind of put together. Now, this is this is kind of a um, this is strictly a South Dakota thing. I this is not something that Oregon did. They did not have a template as such. Um, and I opted to do a template and opted to do kind of this document in hopes that it would help people put the, the proposals together. <clears throat> um, these are not meant to be really long proposals necessarily. Um, and I, and I hope nobody takes this the wrong way, but I'm not looking for a lot of fluff in these. I'm really looking of, of let's get to the point. What is it you're gonna try to accomplish? How are you gonna accomplish it? What's it What's it gonna take to meet your goals, to meet your objectives? Um, what's the budget look like? And then how are you gonna monitor those outcomes? So it's it's not meant to be difficult. It's not meant to be very long and, and verbose kind of a thing. Um, but I wanted to lay out the different sections that we wanted so that we made sure that we got the details that we wanted to get. And so I thought I'd just quickly kind of go through each one, uh, maybe, you know, briefly speak uh, about what it is we want from each one and, and kind of go from there. So um, the first couple are pretty easy. The cover page, it's basically the title of your project, maybe, a, you know, your name and number on it so we know who to contact or who the main point of contact is uh, for the project. You can have multiple partners. And if you want to list all the partners on this sheet, you may but it's meant to be who's the primary person that we're gonna be working with. Um, and like I said, if you've got multiple partners, that's great. Um, that, that to me actually makes it a, a better project if you do have multiple partners. So, but that's all that is, it's essentially a title page. Then the problem statement, um, you know, what is it that you're looking to address? Um, is it water quality in Lake Mitchell? And I'm gonna pick on Lake Mitchell through this a lot because um, for those that don't know, I live in Mitchell. I've been helping with the Lake Mitchell project a little bit. So I'm just gonna use it kind of as my example um, as, as we kind of go through this. So, you know, the biggest thing in Lake Mitchell is, is the phosphorus problem. Um, so, you know, you, you have a little bit of, of, of two, three, four sentences about, you know, how bad the phosphorus problem is in Lake Mitchell as an example, and just kind of lay that out in detail. Then the background, you know, this is, tell us a little bit about your project area. Um, what are the resource concerns, uh, you know, in this region? What are the characteristics of this region? What's the typical operation um, that you're, you're trying to work with? So, you know, with Lake Mitchell, you know, we, we've got two, two situations. One is that um, the, the people that live in and around the lake itself, uh, contribute to the problem. And then we've got those folks that are farming and grazing uh, in the watershed above it in Firesteel Creek watershed um, that, you know, we've got cattle uh, spending a lot of time in the creek. We've got folks that are farming right up to the edge of the creek and therefore, you know, um, sediment carrying phosphorus is, is coming off those fields and into the creek and then obviously ends up into the lake. So, just give us a little background about anything that's going on. If you've had a specific weather event, uh, uh, a tornado or a, excuse me, a flood um, or something that has come in and, and caused a bunch of destruction, maybe a fire, uh, those kinds of things, uh, you know, lay that out in here and just say, hey, you know, we had a, had a major flood come through in 2020 and it washed out a whole bunch of grass waterways. It, it, caused a lot of scouring to take place. And now we're looking to try to address that problem. Uh, you know, uh, lay that kind of information out in this section. The resource, this is really just a list. This, does, this doesn't really even have to be a, a paragraph as such. You can just list the resource concerns that you're looking to address. So with Lake Mitchell, obviously we're looking to, you know, erosion, um, water quality would be kind of the two main ones that we're looking to address in, in Lake Mitchell. We're trying to address that phosphorus situations. 
the desired conditions. This is kind of your goal section. Uh, explain to us how, how you're going to implement this project in a way that will show success, that you're gonna be able to have the success story uh, at the end of this project, that we're gonna have a reason to hold that barbecue like I was talking about earlier. Um, I'm really hoping to change my job into just a permanent party type planner and we're going to a whole lot of barbecues um, with any luck um, because we're gonna be addressing all these resource concerns through this. So um, probably won't be good for my waistline, but that's okay. Um, I'm always up for a good barbecue. Uh, again, this, this essentially is the map, the description of the geographic region. We're looking for the, the overall project area uh, if you have specific priority treatment areas within that project. Um, so as an example, again, Lake Mitchell and the fire steel watershed, you know, we're gonna show the whole watershed as our project area, um, but we're gonna focus in on a few priority areas that are right along the creek. Uh, so, you know, we'll have, a, we'll have, I'll just say, and I'm making this up as I go, so just understand that. Um, we're, we're willing to work with anybody within the watershed, but if somebody, uh, within a half mile of the uh, uh, Fire Steel Creek itself, that'll be our priority area. If, if so, if somebody that owns that piece of property is willing to do something, they they get extra points that are moving to the top. Um, that's Those are the folks that we really wanna target, but anything within the watershed obviously is gonna help. So uh, that would be kind of what that section would look like. Probably a page all in and of itself with just a, a visual of the map of the project area and any priority areas within that. Um, so that we can kind of see what that looks like. Um, alternatives, um, we stuck this in here to help think about NEPA essentially. Um, this doesn't have to be as complicated as NEPA as what it might sound, but this, as, this is meant to be give us, give us what's gonna happen if no action's taken, um, if we take your action um, or is there another is there another route that maybe we could consider as well? So if there's been other alternate alternatives attempted in the past, you could kind of list that too and say what those outcomes were. Um, but we need to make sure that we get this covered because this is a program requirement. So that's what that is meant to, meant to be. Uh, the environmental impacts, this is any data that you have um, to back up your uh, issue. Um, so like with Lake Mitchell, there's been several studies. So you could list those studies. You don't necessarily have to attach them as such, um, but you could say this study was done that shows that 50% uh, of the phosphorus in Lake Mitchell is actually uh, residing on the bottom of the lake. And every time the lake is stirred up, it agitates that phosphorus, which causes al algal blooms. Um, and then what are the practices that you're gonna use to address that? You know, so, you know, again, Lake Mitchell, we would have some buffers, we'd have nutrient management, we'd have crop rotation as being some of our main practices. Uh, and then, you know, some supporting practices um, would be cover crops, things like that, that might use up some of those nutrients uh, before it actually got into the, uh, the creek itself. Uh, the communications plan. We didn't have this in there last year. We added it this year. Um, and actually, in talking with Colette, uh, we may have a little bit of, I'll say, regret of putting it in here as being something that's done um, ahead of time. But it is meant to get you to think about how are you going to involve the public? What is it we're going to be able to share with the public? Who's our target audience going to be? One of the things we really kind of want to focus on is the fact that this has an effect on more people than just the producers we're helping. So again, let's just pick on Lake Mitchell and Lake Mitchell is a great example for this. Um, obviously we're going to assist those producers along the creek with, with their operations and we're going to make improvements. But think about how the whole city of Mitchell, the county surrounding Mitchell are all going to benefit if Lake Mitchell is cleaned up and now becomes a great recreation area. Um, the, you know, obviously there's a lot of people that would love to spend time on Lake Mitchell, uh, playing in the water, boating, fishing, those kinds of things, most of which tend to get shut down at some point during the year because of the phosphorus problem in the lake and the algal blooms that come along with it. So 
think think a little bigger than just the producers you're going to help how how does a general public going to benefit from this um and that's kind of what this communications plan is meant to be there is an attachment that colette put together um and kind of one of our regrets is the fact that it maybe that is a little bit daunting um and so if you do have we're, we're working on some ideas to help assist with that to be honest with you so put something together this is not the end all be all of these things so if you don't have a ton of thought put into this i'm going to tell you not to sweat that this year but we do still want to have some of your thoughts put on paper and we will if you get selected we'll work with you to to try to actually put this communication plan together um, so that we have that actually um, for our public affairs staff or, or any other folks can help us you know, communicate not only the availability of the project, but the success of the project as well. So, um, partnerships, this goes back to what I was saying earlier, if you got conservation commission grants, if ducks, if pheasants, if, you know, whoever um, is willing to help you with your project, if East Dakota is willing to help with the water quality monitoring or, or, or something on that order, um, you know, list it, you know, we're, we're wanting to know um, who's all involved in the project. So make sure you list all your partners here. Um, the prioritizing assistance, this gets at our ranking questions. If you have some screening or ranking questions, you wanna make sure that are used to make sure that these dollars go where they need to go. Um, that's what this is meant to be. You know, give us, give us what you're trying to target, the folks you're trying to target and what those scenarios look like in the form of a question most of you are familiar, we go through a ranking process. We will, even if you don't have these fully developed, we will work with you to fully develop them if you get selected for funding. But this helps us to know that you actually have some targeted folks, some targeted situations that you're wanting to make sure that those dollars go there. So that's what we're after here. The implementation timeline, um, this goes to, this. this is your goals essentially, this is, um how many acres are you going to treat what's your um monitoring plan i'm going to go back to the top here because it caught it kind of wraps over um what what amount of each practice do you need now these are all estimates please remember that there's no way that you know that you're going to implement 5,000 acres of prescribed grazing um in your project it might end up being 4,000, it might end up being 6,322, uh, you know, so you don't know that. So these are estimates, but it gets us to the point of knowing that you are focused in on grazing management and less on nutrient management, let's say, or crop rotation. Um, it, it, it goes to what practices you are targeting. And the reason that's important is that it shows us that you are using the right practices to get at your resource concern, that you are on that right path. Um, if I've got a, a, a um, erosion issue um, and I'm not selecting any practices that deal with erosion, that means there's a disconnect in your project. And so that's what this is meant to, to cover. What is it? What's the main practices you're looking to implement that will address your resource concerns? The measure, measuring and monitoring results is just exactly what it sounds like. Uh, tell us what you're gonna monitor, how you're gonna monitor, who's gonna do the monitoring, how often the monitoring will happen. Um, you know, and depending on your project, some projects, they'll take a sample uh, at the beginning of the project and they won't take another one till the end. Or maybe they'll take one beginning, one in the middle, one at the end. There's, there's not a lot of monitoring that can be done. Let's just say soil health, right? Uh, might take a couple of years for those microbes to change over and for that to improve. So maybe you're only taking a couple samples throughout. Water quality, maybe you're taking them a couple times a year for all five years of your project. Um, so, you know, it, that's going to look different depending on what it is you're trying to accomplish. So those will really vary. But again, the beginning and the end, showing that improvement throughout the project is really what we're after. Uh, the budget. I've left the budget somewhat vague, um, other than we need to know how many dollars you need by program, um, by year. 
um, because obviously that goes to our budget with how many equip dollars we have available, how many CSP dollars, easement dollars, um, how many of those are all available each year. So one thing I tell people about their budgets, again, their estimates. Uh, and so what I say to people is that maybe you request $5,000 in year one, in year two, you've got a request for 10,000, year three is maybe 15,000. Um, year one actually comes along and you're, you're cooking along and you just got a ton of interest and you burn through your 5,000 bucks, no problem. In fact, you, you've got projects that could use money. So what we will do, we, we will be, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to rob Peter to pay Paul kind of a thing and that we'll take some of your $10,000 request out of year two and move it to year one. And we're able to do that because other projects are not gonna have success in year one and, and other ones will. So we will float those dollars around a little bit to try to make sure that your project stays on task. If you got a lot of momentum, we wanna keep that momentum going. So we're gonna do our best to provide you the funding that you need by stealing from your out years if needed or if possible. Now, like I said, the opposite could be true. You could be that project that gets off to a slow start, which is fine, that's gonna happen too. And you don't use your entire $5,000 in year one. You're, you're only gonna use about 3,500. We'll take your 1,500 and we'll, we'll put it towards another project that is um, having a lot of success and got the ball rolling. So you will see that we have some flexibilities. There's gonna be a lot of communication back and forth between us as these projects go, making sure that you have the funding that you need um, to accomplish what you need to accomplish. And then Appendix A and B, um, again, these are some things that we're just looking for. We're looking for a shape file um, so that we can put it on the website um, and those kinds of things. And then Appendix B is if you get letters of support, they're not required. Um, if you have um, studies, data, any of those kinds of things that you feel like you need to include, um, that's what Appendix B is for. So that in a nutshell, um, is kind of the, the template, what we're after out of each one of those. I'm, I can't stress enough that this is not meant to be cumbersome. It's not meant to be something that you spend a lot of time wordsmithing and, and writing up some grand proposal. This is, this is about getting us this information, telling us what you're trying to accomplish, how you're gonna move that needle, and what practices that you're gonna use to, to, to move that conservation needle and how you're gonna monitor it. So keep that in mind and I'll just stress again we're not shooting for the moon here uh, we're looking to make small changes because we know we're dealing with mother nature we're dealing with a very targeted approach and so we're just looking to move that conservation needle so realize that you don't have to have a big great grandiose plan um, that's the one thing that I seem to kind of picked up from last year is everybody's kind of shooting for the moon that's not what we're after and, and I don't think that's realistic to expect. So keep that in mind. So with that, that's kind of what I had to cover, Blaine. I don't know if there's more questions or not, um, but I'm happy to answer anything that anybody has. Yeah, we haven't had any questions yet. Um, yeah, everybody feel free if you have them, throw them out there. Um, you kind of answered my question a little bit. I was just curious from, the, um, from this template here. Um, and I know you said, obviously you guys, you guys do a lot of work. You'll work back and forth for sure. Um, if you like, if you like the plan and like the idea. Um, but I guess with that said, is there is there any part, um, you know, bullet point that you see kind of the most, you know, the biggest barrier, kind of the most that's kind of struggled with or should be looked at a little bit harder? There's there's actually two things that I would say. One is obviously the monitoring. Um, People are struggling with that because that's not something NRCS has done in the past. Um, and a lot of projects don't typically call for any kind of, of monitoring of those, of those resource concerns or measuring those resource concerns. That, that in a way has kind of been one of the biggest struggles out of all of this. And um, if, if you're struggling with it, please say something, please ask some questions. I'm not saying I got the answers. Um, but I'm certain I can put you in touch with somebody that can help you figure that out. Um, the other thing would be um, describing the problem and this, this kind of the, 
Well, it's kind of the resource concern slash target area and matching those up. People struggle with that a little bit. People always, I love our agency. I, I love the conservation district. We want to help everybody. And typically what I see is people are trying to make the target area is too big because they're worried about excluding somebody. Um, and I can appreciate that. I, I understand where that thought process comes from, but realize that if we can have success in this area, in, in even if it's only within a couple of years, we can do another project that borders it, that builds on it, that expands it, whatever terminology you want to use to now catch more people to then again, do a better job of addressing that resource concern on a, on a, on a bigger scale, but we'll still be able to measure it. It'll still be targeted, um, but it'll expand on each other. So um, one of the things that we're going to do as a leadership team is to try to make sure that we don't have too many projects in one area um, that we don't become spread so thin that we're not, again, doing a good job of conservation planning. So you will be able to have multiple projects going, but we're not going to let you have 10, 15, 20 projects going um, in an area because there just won't be enough staff to make that happen. So, um, yeah, that's those are kind of the two big things that I would say, Blaine, that people struggle with a little bit. And I'm willing to help on either one or find people that can help you appropriately. Absolutely. Great. Um, one other question here, since you're on detail in Nebraska, should proposal be submitted to somewhere else or still the info that you have on the bottom? You can still use the info on the bottom. Um, it'll come to me and I believe it also comes to Jen Wirtz, if I'm not mistaken. Um, no, maybe it is just me. Well, either way, I'll make sure they get where they need to go. Um, Actually, with any luck, I'll be done with my detail by the time we start making selections, but we'll see, I guess. Okay. There is that chance it doesn't happen. <laughs> if I'm not, I'll make sure they got to get to where they got to be, so. All right. Um, any other questions from anyone before we wrap up? Um, is Jeff or someone else willing to provide a brief review of a proposal prior to submission? Yes. Yes, absolutely. If you want to contact me, you can, um, or you can certainly contact your local DC, your local resource unit conservationist, or even your local assistant for field operations, and they will gladly look them over and have discussions with you about those proposals. Perfect. Good, because yeah, we're coming up on April 15th that they're due for this year. Correct. Yep. So yeah three weeks away-ish. Yep. Right around the corner. Yes, sir. Okay, before we um, wrap it up, if there's any other questions, um, chime in now. Or if you have any questions afterwards, um, feel free to reach out to me or, or Jeff and we can um, make sure that it gets answered. Absolutely. But with that, that looks like that's all the questions for today. Um, Very good. So yeah, thank you for thank you for joining us from sunny Nebraska. Um, yep. Probably windy Nebraska today and yesterday. Yesterday was today. The flag is the flag right outside my window is just hanging, so there's not much of a breeze today. But yesterday was plenty breezy. So yeah, yeah. I'll dial down a little bit here. Very good. Well, I'm thanks great. everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to share that with you. And yeah, any questions or comments? This is a living document as well. We're we're always tweaking it to make sure that it's right. So if you find something to be, you know, troublesome, certainly let me know. We can see if there's something we can do to change it, to make it better. Um, like I said, we we're, we're going to offer this every year, so always willing to make it, uh, adjustments as necessary. So just let us know. Perfect. Well, all right, with that, we will wrap it up and end the webinar. But uh, yeah, thanks everybody for joining. Um, and yeah, let us know if you have any questions. But with that, thank you, Jeff, for joining us. Um, everybody have a good rest of the day. You too, thank you. Yep, thank you. Bye. Bye.